And good morning, everybody. Welcome to FSU Coach Live. My name's Tim Baghurst, and I'm joined uh, with a special guest this morning, Dr. Cecile Renaud. Cecile, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, it's a real privilege, and, and I'm excited to hear what you have to share. If you would, just give us a little bit of a background of your history and, and kind of how you went through volleyball as a career. Well, I uh, grew up in St. Louis in Webster Groves, Missouri, and then I went to school at Missouri State played volleyball there, taught a year of junior high and high school in a little town called Steelville, Missouri, and coached four sports. And then one year later, I got an offer to come to Florida State University in 1976 as the head coach. Mm -hmm. And uh, that included working on my master's degree. So I was a graduate student, but actually the head coach. And then uh, coached here for 26 years and then was a, a faculty member in sport management uh, until 2015. But USA Volleyball really gave me a lot of opportunities to get involved outside of the Florida State realm. So I got involved in coaching a variety of international teams and uh, championships and, uh, and coaching clinics. So it's uh, that's really kind of how I got my passion. Now, you said you were a coach. You came to Florida State and then you coached there for 26 years. A, a couple of things. One, how difficult was it as um as a woman getting hired in a predominantly male coaching world. And secondly, we see a lot of coaches move around a lot uh, in today's society. You didn't. What, what kind of helped you stay in one place for such a long time? Well, in 1976, let me give you the salary. Uh, so it was $3,000. So there weren't a lot of men that were applying for that position. Mm -hmm. And then in 1978, it went full time. So uh, back in the 70s, it was really primarily just women coaching women's teams. It was you know, over 90 percent of that. And uh, we did have a few male coaches on staff uh, with uh, track and swimming. But uh, the rest of us were all women. And, uh, and it was just a great place to work. I did get uh, offered a few different jobs and interviewed at a few different places. Uh, the University of Tennessee, uh, Pat Summit kept trying to get me to come up there. University of Kentucky, the University of Iowa. And I eventually just decided that I really wanted to stay here. I, I really enjoyed uh, Tallahassee in Florida. And uh, my sister re reminded me that people don't retire and uh, move to Iowa. But, you know, I was born in Iowa. So, you know, there was a, a draw to the Big Ten. And of course, the, the SEC schools were fascinating. But I ended up staying here and it was really the best thing for me. Well, we should mention for those of you watching, if you have a question for Cecile at any point, just put it in your chat box and it'll come to me and we can we can get it out to her. When when we look at your coaching legacy, we should mention you're in the Hall of Fame. I was watching your your speech just before this interview. You know, talk about what you have to do as a coach in order to demonstrate su sustained success. Right. Coaches can be, you know, have a, a great year or a great couple of years but you did it year after year after year. And, and kind of if I'm going into the coaching field, what kind of tips or advice would you give me to make sure that that happens for me? Well, it's, that's a great question. I mean, certainly you have to know your material, what, you know, whatever the sport is, you've got to be an expert in, uh, in that aspect, te uh, teaching tactics and techniques. But then I think you've also got to really become a people person. Uh, you know, we're not coaching volleyball, we're coaching people. And so you've really got to master those relationships. And I think uh, to me, that was one of the most important things. And I got much better at it as I got more experienced. Mm -hmm. uh, I also talked less and I listened more. I asked more questions uh, instead of just telling everybody what to do. You know, I make suggestions and then I would ask them questions. You know, why did you do this? What did you see here? How do you think we can, you know, what defense should we be playing? And really gave them much more ownership and involvement in the team. But I also think uh, you've got to just enjoy the daily process. I, and, and we hear that a lot. I loved being a coach every day. It wasn't just for the championships or uh, the competition on the weekends, but it was going to practice every day. Uh, it was going to the office every day. It was involved with staff every day. And I mean, it's it's every day, you know, and a lot of times there were just no weekends off. And But, you know, I didn't know any different. That's just how I'd always uh, been. And that's how much I enjoyed what I was doing. Mm. I read a book, you mentioned Pat Summit, and I read her uh, autobiography, and, and she talked about having to adapt the way she coached to right. the different generations of athletes. 
I'm assuming that happened to you as well. And so what did you, how did you adapt and what things did you do in order to better, you know, kind of make connections with the athletes that you're coaching? You know, I heard a song, I have music playing in the house usually, and I heard a song came on yesterday. It, it came on and it was from like the 1970s. Uh, and I just, it brought me back to when we used to drive in a 15 passenger van with uh, 15 people and their luggage and listen to the AM radio. And, and so there was, you know, the way I treated those athletes, I think, was a little different because I was 22 when I started and a lot of them were in their late teens, or early 20s. And I think uh, just trying to uh, learn how to study myself and uh, I didn't really change things, except we had a lot of Ph.D. students in sports psychology, as you know, that wanted to come over and work with the team. And I said, I'd really rather you work with me. So they they take they uh, taped me videotaped me, audio taped me, and really studied how I reacted with everybody. And I, I think that helped me as a coach uh, because we look at videos of our teams all the time and we think it's them. And a lot of times it's just the way the message comes across. So I think I became a better communicator. Again, I think I talked less and listened more. Yeah, that's, that's a great point about, you know, observing yourself or having somebody observe you and provide that impartial feedback. And and it's something in the, the interviews that we've been doing, we don't see too much of. And, and so it's great that you're talking about that, about being a better coach. We, we have a question for you, and it's from Vanessa Fuchs, who was a guest last week, by the way. So be sure to check out her uh, great interview. Cecile, can you talk about the importance of mentoring and the impact mentoring can have on advancing your career? Thanks, Vanessa. Uh, great to hear from you, and I hope you're doing well. In, uh, in our lockdown here. Uh, I think mentoring was so important in my career. I really uh, grew up with primarily female coaches. I had Dr. Mary Jo Wynn at Missouri State, a uh, dollar. And then when I came to Florida State, I took over for Dr. Billy Jones. And Dr. Billy Jones still lives in town here today. Uh, and we're in constant contact with her always. But I think uh, being able to have access to those people when I had questions or issues, it was really important. Uh, Pat Summit, I met in 1983. I was with, uh, I think it was the World University Games team, and they were training the Pan Am team in Colorado Springs. And she noticed that I was with an all male staff, and I noticed that it was an all female staff, Kay Yao, Sylvia Hatchell. And, uh, and so we, we start, Pat and I started playing racquetball together. And I thought it was really a great friendship and a great mentorship because she was in a different sport. So I could share anything with her and uh, tell her any weakness I thought we were having or I was having. And it, uh, it wasn't going to hurt me competitively. But I, I thought it was really important to have that cross sport uh, mentorship. And of course, you know, we and all the different coaches at Florida State that were here, you know, Sue Semra, who's still here, uh, Joanne Graff. Uh, and, and the male coaches as well. We always got together and talked about a variety of things because they're the ones that are in the uh, in the profession with you. So they're the best ones to help you. Yeah, it, interesting point that uh, you, you don't necessarily have to have the mentor from the sport that you actually coach because, as you said, you know, there's so much that goes on outside of the X's and O's sure. that are really determined whether you are an excellent coach or not. In one of the one of the classes I know that you've taught for many years is athlete recruitment, and and that's quite a challenge for a lot of coaches. And and there's a lot of compliance rules and so on. Do you have any advice based on your experiences of how best to recruit student athletes to your program? Well, I got uh, really interested in recruiting when I was working on my PhD at Florida State. So I. I thought, you know, you've got to come up with a topic that you really want to read a lot about. And I thought recruiting would make the biggest impact uh, in coaching. So I studied what uh, decision making, uh, what factors young women decide on making a decision to attend a Division I university to play volleyball. Mm -hmm. And going through that, just all the research on why people make decisions. And, uh, and it was fascinating, just the general student and then uh, student athletes. So, I, uh, I went back and looked at all the different ways that young kids decide on schools, and they really they decide at a very young age. They've got a choice set. So they might be in grade school, junior high, and they you know, their parents have been to a university. They've been on different campuses, so they start thinking about things. And so I think it's really important that coaches understand that from a young age, uh, young students are going to start thinking about where they want to go to college. Yeah. I think it's one of the most important things that we found is the campus visit. 
once they come on campus, mm -hmm. they really understand whether or not they feel like they're going to be at home there and if that's where they want to spend the next four years. So uh, just being honest with them, uh, telling them what your strengths are, you know, we really stay away from negative recruiting. That's just not ever going to pay off. But really, what do you have and uh, to provide for that student athlete? And then also just making sure it's a good fit. And is this where they'd want to be if they weren't playing that sport? You know, I think that's important. And then, you know, just the relationships with the student athletes and the coaching staff. And uh, again, just showing them around the campus and, and hoping that they feel comfortable here. And I'm assuming during this recruiting process and even during your coaching, you're, you're able to articulate your coaching philosophy and, and the approach that you have. Can I ask what your coaching philosophy has been and has it changed over the years? Well, it really it boiled, kind of boiled down to what does it take to play here? What does it take to stay here? And what does it take to be successful here? And, and to stay here, it was be responsible, uh, be respectful. And, and those things really covered everything from you know going to class, yeah. uh, being respectful to the officials, uh, being responsible uh, in your coursework, showing up on time. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's really, I mean, it's, it wasn't a very hard philosophy to follow. It was just, I was going to treat you like you wanted to be treated and like I wanted to be treated. And anybody that comes in to watch a team play can pretty much tell that coaching philosophy just by watching, you know, good sportsmanship, uh, community service, uh, everything that goes into it besides just winning. Mm -hmm. Now you, you kind of, talked a little bit about your international experience and, and got into USA Volleyball and then last year became the, the president of the board of directors. It's, it's a very unique position. Can you tell us a little bit about what your roles and responsibilities are in a position like that? Sure. It's, it's really, I'm the chair of the board. Uh, our CEO okay. is actually the president. So I'm the chair of the USA Volleyball Board of Directors. Uh, I've been on this board earlier in my career and then uh, came on it again about six years ago. And it, we really oversee all aspects of the sport. So we uh, supervise the national teams. Uh, that's the indoor teams, uh, men's and women's national teams, our Olympic teams, which have qualified for the Olympic Games. And then we oversee beach volleyball. Uh, men's and women's and all of those teams and athletes. And then we also oversee uh, the Paralympic teams, our sitting team, our men's and women's teams. And then there are regions, there are 40 regions around the country that uh, offer memberships uh, to individuals and they play and pay membership through those regions. We have events, we uh, over officiating. Uh, it, it's just a large staff. We've got about 90 people uh, located in Colorado Springs is our main office. Uh, Anaheim is where the indoor teams train in California. Uh, the beach teams train in Torrance, California. And then our sitting teams, our Paralympic teams train in, train in Edmond. So uh, just overseeing this board, it's just making sure that we've got everything in place for uh, athletes at the international level down to 12 year olds uh, to be successful in uh, coaching education, officials training. It, uh, it really encompasses everything that has to do with volleyball in the United States. That's a, that's. That's a lot of work. It almost sounds like a full-time job. It, it, well, it is. And, uh, you know, so I was voted president at a meeting. And by the next day, you know, my email box just blew up with, uh, you know, all kinds of things, uh, questions, comments, congratulations. Oh, my gosh. Are you sure you want to do this? But it's been, you know, it's a fascinating experience. It's uh, some sport I've spent my whole life in. And so I, I thought, you know, what the heck? I. I'm retired. I have time for this. So, you know, I spend a lot of time on conference calls, a lot of times traveling. Uh, just we've rehired our CEO uh, last year, and he's now signed on through uh, the next quad. So, you know, a lot of responsibility comes with being in that position. Mm -hmm. Well, just a reminder, if you're just joining us to, to put a question in the chat box for Cecile, and we'll get it to her. When, when we talk about being in charge of a, an a national sport like this, a national team or many national teams, I guess, with all the disciplines, how do you, or do you have any strategies to, to help keep volleyball relevant in a competing market where every sport is trying to gain notoriety and, you know, uh, media time and all that? How do you, how do you make sure that happens with volleyball? Well, we make sure we have a good product, uh, qualified coaches. Uh, we really, one of our top priorities for USA Volleyball is safety first, and that's making sure that all coaches have gone through a safety training 
uh, by Safe Sport, which is a US OPC mandated area. So everybody's been through that, officials, coaches, uh, athletes have got to take some type of training. So we make sure everybody's safe. Uh, we do a lot of things with events around the country. We've got a great event staff that put on the best events. We have qualifiers that uh, students go to. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it, it's just a lot of work that goes into making sure we have a good product put on the court. And I, again, it's our, the knowledge of our coaches. I think it's a fun team sport. Uh, they can play it for a lifetime. We have a USA Volleyball Opens, which I think they have a division that's 75 and over. Uh, oh. People play for their lifetime. So uh, it's just been a great sport. It's one of the most popular sports at the college level, especially for women. And uh, we get 12 scholarships at uh, Division One universities. And it's, it's been a, there's been no uh, lack of people coming out to play. I think it's the second most popular sport now behind uh, soccer. Mm. I want to take you back to, to your coaching. And one of the classes I'm teaching right now is, is ethics in, in coaching. Can you talk a little bit about maybe some examples of difficult situations you've had through your career and, and how you find a resolution to those problems? Because, you know, as coaches, we always come across some, some are minor, some are major. Do you, did you have a system for figuring out how to get the best of maybe a worse situation? You know, I did, and I, I was really fortunate to, to uh, be around a, a variety of coaches. I, I, ethics were never anything that uh, I ever had a problem with. Let me just explain it. So my first uh, coaching job in Steelville, Missouri, I was the softball coach, and we had a couple of our fast pitch. We were playing fast pitch. So our pitchers went to cheerleading practice instead of coming to, the, uh, to practice for us, and, uh, and we were going to play. Uh, softball and softball game the next day. So I benched both of our pitchers. Well, we had no other pitchers. We ended up losing uh, 45 to nothing. One of wow. my experiences. And I, there, I just, it never even entered my mind that I would uh, back down and let them back in. You know, I felt like it was important that they had a responsibility. Uh, they made a choice to go to a cheerleading practice instead of coming to one of ours before a district game. So that uh, kind of set the tone for me early. And then I, I had a, a, a woman that was here on campus for years, Dr. Daisy Flory. Uh, she was one of those people when she was in the room and she spoke, everybody turned and listened. And she said, you know, I always try and make a decision on if whether someone's caught in the system or they're trying to take advantage of it. And I think as a coach, if you look at that, you know, sometimes there is a mistake or an oops or it happened one time. You know, you look at that differently than someone that you feel like is trying to take advantage of something and you handle that uh, discipline, I think, a different way. Mm. So kind of considering whether somebody is doing it because they're trying to be manipulative or get away with things versus right. this just happened. It was out of my control or I didn't know. Okay. Or they, or you, just, you know, if someone got in trouble, you know, like we just disciplined them. We went on, you know, I wasn't going to hold a grudge. They weren't doing it to, uh, to be mean. They just were young and not very smart. And so we just kind of helped them find their way back. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we have a former player on um, who you may know, and she says, thank you for all you did for me while I was a player for you at FSU. I'm going to be a coach at a brand new high school and wanted to hear your best advice for starting a new competitive program. Great question. Thanks, Adria. Good to see you. I hope you and your family are doing well up in, I believe it's in South Carolina. Uh, I think really just trying to get the best athletes that you can and the best students and people that want to be in the gym. I, I think that's really important. Uh, if I know you've got the knowledge and I know your uh, husband is very knowledgeable about the sport as well, but just make sure that you've got a good foundation, you know, spend enough time on techniques and tactics, uh, try and make sure everything that you do with the team on the court is game like. Uh, the ball's always coming over the net. It's always coming from a partner. Coaches, keep yourself out of the drills as much as possible. And I think just a good foundation, uh, and especially at a high school, is getting the parents involved and making sure that they understand what your philosophy is, what you're going to try and accomplish, and what their roles will be as well. And, uh, and so if you can get a good relationship with the parents, get them involved in the program, let them come in and watch, I think that, that'll be positive for you. Another question coming in, this time from Jason Hendricks. A small book, Jason. <laughs> he ran out of room. 
Uh, Dr. Renaud, you've been a great example of success, mentorship, and passion for guiding and leading by example. What are three qualities that you believe are the most important when mentoring others? And what are those three qualities and mentees should look like in that example? Well, Jason was a former student, so of course he would give the professor a hard time with this, but <laughs> again, it's got to be about people. You've got to have good people skills, and so we, we spend a lot of time reading books on, on volleyball or basketball or a sport, but you've got to learn uh, how to deal with relationships. I think you've also got to be honest with people, uh, get everybody in the program involved, so honesty is important, uh, certainly as we talked about ethics, but being a good sport. But I think it's really just trying to learn how to communicate with people and manage people because everything else will fall into place if you can do that. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to, to you as a coach and you were at FSU for, I think you said 23, Six. 26 years. Coaching, huh? did, you, did you ever kind of feel a point where you just felt burned out or, or just stressed and why am I doing this? Let's just, um, it's not worth it. And, and if so, how did you deal with that? If not, what did you do to help you continue year after year without feeling kind of that pressure, that, that burnout that a lot of coaches experience? You know, my mother told me, and I believe it was in high school, she said, you know, you just need to slow down. And I thought, mm. okay. So, you know, I never really did slow down and I never really did get burned out. I uh, used to run a lot. I used to run an hour and a half a day, or I'd play competitive racquetball at noon with our uh, athletic director and our football assistant coaches. And so I did a lot of things competitively uh, just to try and keep myself uh, on top and you know thinking clearly. Uh, and again, then I would just talk to friends about uh, what they were thinking in their career. And then when I got to uh, the 26th year, and, and, and again, at Florida State University, they had upgraded all their facilities and Tully Jim was really uh, never got uh, any major upgrades while I was coaching. So it became a little frustrating uh, to recruit student athletes and, and have them come in, uh, having just left, you know, some beautiful facilities around the country. And I finally decided, you know, maybe it's just time to step down. And I think you have to recognize when it's time to turn it over and let someone new come in and ask for the same things you might have been asking for for years. So uh, that was the only point was in uh, 2001 when I decided, you know, I think I'm ready to step over and maybe do some teaching and uh, and let somebody else come in and try and move this along too. Mm. Well, I, I'm going to follow up with a question, but we have one in the comments again for Vanessa Cecile. You've always remained highly involved with boards, associations, organizations throughout your career. What are some opportunities young aspiring coaches should consider to allow them be, to become involved and start building a national network of contacts? <laughs> Well, that's a great question, Vanessa. And I do think uh, what I did when I was younger, as I went into various camps and clinics, I, I attended every clinic I could possibly attend. And you always got to meet all the people that were there. I worked at camps around the country. You know, I laugh when I think about who I worked at the camps with. Nick Haley from Texas, uh, Russ Rose from Penn State. You know, we all worked at a camp up at Western Michigan. And I just always... Uh, tried to meet as many people as I could and travel and attend uh, various events. I think trying to get involved with your national organization, USA Soccer, USA Basketball, coach some of those outside teams and, you know, try and work your way up. I think serving on a board is one of the best things you can do because you really have responsibility for that organization. You know, I told my classes, you know, if we want to make the basketball square, you can get on the USA basketball board and or some other board and say, we're going to play with the square basketball. I mean, that's just, that's the power that a board has. So why not get yourself in the room where people are making those decisions and try and have an impact where that sport's going to go. Mm -hmm. Are there any general organizations that may not be sport specific that you would recommend college students, for example, who are interested in going to coaching uh, join and be a part of now? Well, uh, you know, I'm, the past president of an organization called We Coach, mm -hmm. and it's uh, for primarily for women and just trying to make sure that women are supported, where they're educated, uh, they're promoted, and, uh, and and making sure that they're ready for the jobs and that they start applying for as many jobs as they can in men's sports and women's sports. I think student organizations, students are also welcome to uh, join that organization. I think, uh, again, there are a variety of things that students can get involved in, uh, sport organizations on campus. Uh, they can start coaching at a young age. Uh, so all these club teams in town, basketball, volleyball, swimming, they all need uh, 
people to help coach youth sport. I think that's a good way to get involved in well as well and also network. Yeah, good point. Uh, Jason has a question. Hi, Dr. Renaud. Always great to hear from you. I have two young girls who have expressed an interest in playing volleyball. What would your recommendations be in getting them started to maintain that interest level and not create burnout at a young age? Jason, I'm so excited your daughters are interested in playing volleyball. I think you make sure you get them into an organization uh, locally that does a good job of uh, providing a good experience. Uh, ask parents that have had their children involved in those clubs. Uh, meet with the coaches, meet with the directors, and then just uh, make sure that they're having fun. I think the biggest thing that we forget about in sport is that it's got to be fun. And so many times as coaches, we just uh, start to bear down on being successful. And it's really just following the process. So if they go into their clubs, they get on a team and they have fun and they're learning a little bit. To me, that's what's important. And they won't have the burnout. But once once coaches start going for uh, talking about winning over having fun and how can we be successful and just getting one point better every day, then I think it gets out of hand. I, you know, I also think they need to be involved in several different activities. You know, if it's swimming, track, volleyball, but don't you know, don't just get uh, sidetracked and get into one sport too early because I do think you get burned out. Yeah, that's that's a great point. The sport specialization and and just being willing to to experiment and try different sports and a lot a lot of times we see those sports actually help the sport that you end up right. in. Uh, Joanne Pomodoro says as a therapist who works with coaches and athletes both men and women with eating disorders on the college level are you noticing an increase and what are you and your coaches doing to address this serious issue with the athlete's image being projected as kind of a, a wonder woman or a superman well, disordered eating is, has been around for a long time. And I think what coaches try and do is really just give them opportunities to eat uh, good nutrition and have uh, provide them with opportunities. You know, when we travel on trips, make sure you're taking them to restaurants and providing food that give them good choices to uh, fuel their bodies the correct way. I think one of the big mistakes coaches make is to start uh, – focusing on someone's uh, body image or body weight and that really uh, can progress in a terrible way and, and people have got to have the experience and the uh, expertise to know how to talk about to with an athlete about that so i think it's important that we just talk about here's here's good fuel here's how you can uh, eat to maintain your this motor that we've got going on and really try and focus on you know the right fluids and the right type of foods because volleyball is very much, a, you know, a, a visual sport, right? The, the players are wearing um, limited clothing, we'll say, and, and it can be an easily turn into something where they start to think about how they look rather than the performance they're doing. I never really thought of it as a visual sport. But that's just me. Well, I, 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 you know, an, an example. No, I, no, I certainly understand. I certainly understand. And it's, I think, you know, people have got to just sort of learn to accept how they look. The, the most important thing is, are they efficient as an athlete? Can they uh, jump well? Can they maintain their endurance for a, you know, two or three hour volleyball match? And do they feel good about themselves? And, you know, we've, one of the things we've got to do with young kids is to give them confidence. And, uh, and that's what sport should do is build them up, not tear them down. So we've got to really stay focused on the positive and, uh, and help young kids get through this. Another question. Hi, Dr. Renaud. I still remember the day when I met you for the first time in your office back in 2008. You were very patient to share with me your history with the Chinese coach, Lang Ping. Would you please share with us uh, more stories about working with other coaches from different countries? And I'll maybe say kind of what strategies do you do to make sure that those conversations are effective? Well, and I'm, he may be uh, sending in his question. I'm not sure if he's still in China, but thank you for that question. Uh, Long Ping was, you know, she she was such a famous volleyball player in China and now their head coach and just won the gold medal in 2016 as a coach. Uh, she was so popular in China. They, I think she has a postal stamp after her. Her wedding was broadcast nationally. Wow. But, but Long Ping, uh, and she was a USA national team coach um, I'm not sure what quad it was, but she has coached for the U.S. women. I think internationally we have various uh, conferences and clinics where people share ideas. Uh, the FIVB puts on a variety of international coaching conferences. So 
but, you know, I've had an opportunity to learn and watch a lot of different coaches around the, the world. And it's fascinating some of the differences and but you know a lot of things are still the same so you know through the internet and uh, and video streaming you're able to watch and really talk to anybody around the world about what they're doing mm. you've been around coaching for for many years and, and not just volleyball you, you talked about working with different coaches and and different sports if if somebody is looking to go into coaching or improve their opportunities in coaching and maybe move up you know, kind of looking back at your experiences and what you've learned, what suggestions would you have for them in order to help them be more successful? Well, a couple of things come to mind. And, and one of the, when I was coaching at Florida State, I, you know, I got recommended by my college coach. Uh, you know, it wasn't that, uh, you know, I, I was the best college coach, but this is, you know, there was a connection with uh, Billy Jones and, and Southwest Missouri State. So I was given that opportunity. I think if you're given an opportunity, really give it everything you've got. And then people notice and will try and recommend you. Uh, and, and you don't have to be looking for a job, but people are going to notice you as a person. They're going to notice your work ethic. And when they have a position come open, they might think of you uh, and not, you're not going to get it. I, I think people think that they're only going to get a job when it's open, but the, the interview process goes on long before that. People are doing a search. And then with this coaching certificate that you've got now at Florida State University, you know, that we started several years ago, and I had a student come in and say, well, what do I get when I compete? But when I get these four courses done, I'll get a certificate. What's that going to do for me? And I said, okay, you're not going to like this answer, but you're going to be really smart. And he went, oh, yeah, okay. I hadn't thought of that. I went, so, you know, you can put it on your resume. But more importantly, you're going to have a lot more knowledge than anybody else will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and it's I'm laughing because I, I'm I'm getting these questions myself. You know, well, what will this do for me? And it's kind of well, what are you going to put into it? It's, right. it's you're going to get something on your resume, but that's just a that's just a line item. It's the knowledge and the content that you've kind of learned in that that makes you so much better. Um, and so. Then Coaches would come back that, that took the class or students would come back and say, you know, I had a conversation with a division one coach. I never thought I'd have, I could talk to them about this. I could talk mm -hmm. to them about that. And so that's what that education did for them. It gave them a, a way to get enter the conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If, if anybody has questions for you or wants to follow up or, or wasn't able to get their question on today, what's the best way for them to reach you? Well, they can uh, reach me through email, and that's just my last name, Renaud, at fsu.edu. And uh, I'll be happy to get back with them and answer any questions I can. Well, thank you so much for joining me this morning. I really appreciate your time and, and contributions to sport as well, and, and obviously wish you the best as you continue as in, in your role with USA Volleyball during a very unusual time, I think it's fair to say. So you find yourself in the hot seat at a uh, – a time when maybe you didn't anticipate this, but um, I also want to mention coming up over the, the course of the week, be sure to join in. We have more special guests uh, tomorrow. Of course, we have coach storms will be joining us at 2 PM. He's the head strength and conditioning coach for FSU Seminoles football. Um, but Cecile, thanks so much for joining me. I, I really appreciate your time. Thanks Tim. And thanks everybody for tuning in. Appreciate it.